Let's get started. This course is difficult. Uh, not much of a surprise there. Yes, I know. It's, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, but given your responses and uh, how much stress it's causing, let's let up for just a minute here. So if you look at the schedule, you may see not some of this already. But let's make a few changes here. Uh, so demo three was supposed to be due next week. Uh, that would, and this is by far the hardest demo for the project, so that wouldn't really be fair to, to release that and then expect you to do it by next week's lab. That's ridiculous. So no demo four, demo three do what demo four was, and demo three is going to be worth 200 points instead of 100. So it'll be effectively demos three and four. Um, and the demo four requirement for the whole project is demo I'm just, I'm basically just reading the slides, I think. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but the demo for showing, demoing the whole project together, that won't be a requirement anymore. I'm sad to see it go, uh, to build the whole project, it's awesome to see your project come together. But, I, but with the changes, I just don't have a way to work it into the schedule since you can't share code with your teammates until after the deadline. And the deadline for some of you is 10 p.m. on Friday, the last day of classes. There's just no more room to put demo for. Uh, so we'll just move demo three to the demo four slot and double the points. Uh, I'll have more details about demo three as, uh, as we go forward. I'm hoping to have that release like tonight or tomorrow, uh, but we'll get there. Lab this week, no coding. It'll be more of like a reflection lab. I have a TA meeting after lecture today. I want to talk with the TAs, get their ideas, and see what that lab should be. But it won't be technical, it won't be coding. It'll be more of, uh, more of ideas and possibly brainstorming ideas for your game for demo three, working with your team and that's deciding how the structure should be, uh, deciding who's gonna do what part and things like that. But no coding for this week's lab. Right, yeah, oh, no, no more great slides like that, unfortunately. But, but I wanna uh, take a step back from the course, just reflect on, on kind of a few things of where we've been and make a few things of the course explicit, a little more clear that I, I put out there, but I haven't seen very many students doing or taking advantage of. So I just wanted to talk about two, two specific things. Uh, to start, testing. We all know this. I'm making you write unit tests for every homework, unit tests for some lecture questions, unit tests for the project, unit tests for some labs. There's testing going on all over the place, which is how you're testing your code and being sure that your code is correct without having to submit to auto lab. So when you're beyond this class, and especially after you graduate, you're out there in the working world or you're working on your own projects, you have a good understanding of how to test your code without getting that feedback from auto lab, which is why there's no feedback. To write the unit tests, make sure your code works, be confident that it works, so you can release code without bugs out there to your customers. So I think you all get that part. I've been hammering that a lot, and it's on every homework. We've been doing this nonstop. But there are a few other things related to testing that I haven't seen so much in office hours after class, uh, talking to the TAs. I just haven't seen students taking advantage of, so I want to talk about two things like that for, for now. Um, jumper, both of these things are in the past, that's why the reflection. But I just want to put reminders out there to, to show you uh, uh, another aspect of testing that I haven't made as explicit as I wanted to. Jumper, you saw this on Lab Activity 1, you downloaded the jumper code. It was almost a complete game. It was just missing the physics engine. And then for your homework, you built the physics engine. So for lab activity one, you made one change to the code, one addition to the physics engine to move one of the players, do any minimal amount of change. To show you that you have a game with a physics engine, you can play that game. But I didn't see very many people playing it during, uh, during office hours when they had their questions. When the intent here, which I didn't make explicit enough, I'll do it right now, is that by writing unit tests, especially when computing the face that you're colliding with on a static object, writing unit tests for that is a huge pain. It can take hours just to generate one test to compute all the numbers by hand and figure out what the test case is supposed to be and everything. Uh, it takes a long time to do that. 
or you fire up the game with your physics engine and you notice that you fall through platforms. You find out real quick if you're running that game. That was the intent, so you could do some testing without having to write out the unit test, um, but I just didn't see much of that. Uh, also that we were making a whole, a whole app. You could run this app, it had a GUI, it had all the code there to actually uh, run this app. I want to show you that we're building complete software in this course. You're doing some, some pretty powerful stuff. Thinking of the hackathon coming up, you can actually build some really cool projects in the hackathon. You're ready for that. You're at that level where you're building full programs. What, like Clicker, you built a full program there. I gave almost no starter code for this. I only gave enough starter code just to get the structure of things to make sure we're on the same page with what files need to be created, which classes need to be actors, etc. I gave almost no starter code. I just didn't want somebody having an object instead of a class in some spots. I just didn't want those things causing issues and wasting your time. Uh, that's the only code I gave you. I didn't really give you any functionality at all. You built an entire game. For Lab Activity 5, you built the GUI for it, and you connected to my server and played the game through your GUI. And then for the homework, you built your server. Everything you were connecting to in that lab with your GUI, you built that. You have a server that you can connect to over the internet, and anyone, once you have that running, anyone on the planet can play your game over the internet through those web sockets. Uh, and I didn't really see anybody playing the game. They were, you, were, you were all writing your unit tests, you were all writing your code, and, and looking in IntelliJ and looking at all this code, but I didn't see uh, almost none of you playing the game. And I just want to make sure you realize that you built a full program, though. You built a network app that you can play. You can swap out my, uh, my server with your localhost 8080, and you can fire up your server and play your game. Yeah, and anyone in that situation, if you tried this and it couldn't get it working and communicating, talk to me, come to office hours, talk to me after class, talk to me before class. I, I really want to get into that part. This is something I can't auto grade or else this would be part of the auto grade. I'd make sure all of you realize that you built that app that it's all working and everything. Uh, it's not something I can auto grade, so I really leave it up to you to take that last step and actually use your app. Uh, if you're having any issues with that, please, please, please talk to me. Uh, that's. That's the payoff for those, on average, 20 hours of work that you put in. Uh, that's the payoff, is actually seeing the game that you built. And admittedly, the game kind of intentionally isn't all that fun, um, but it's a proof of concept of what you can do. And then if you completed the bonus, the bonus is where I'm showing you that you can make it more fun. Uh, I only have three, pieces, three things of equipment, just the bare minimum to make sure that, that you can handle different equipment and stuff. But if you build that out to be a full clicker game with like 10, 20 different pieces of equipment, your game is ready for that. You can actually make that a pretty fun game. You can add some graphics to your GUI and make a full, uh, full clicker game or expand it into you know, something like the, the project that we're doing in the lab. You, you have all the foundation. It's just adding more layers of complexity uh, just adding more features, just adding more stuff. Clicker is kind of that base foundation that has all the components of this pretty complex network app uh, that you know now know how to build, that you can build something like that. It's, uh, I just want to make sure everyone realizes you, know, you, you built that whole thing. You built a pretty cool thing. Uh, even if you didn't finish the whole, uh, the whole assignment, even if you got through objective one, if you built the core of that game, you just had to add that network case to get a fully networked game that anyone on the planet can play, you just run it. Uh, and, and just in case, I haven't heard anyone ask this, but just to, to get ahead of it, to deploy on a server, like I had that deploy at a domain name, there's nothing special about that. It takes some steps to, to actually you know, get the server set up and everything, but there's nothing really special about that. It's not really any different than just running on your laptop. Uh, there's nothing special about web servers or servers. Servers are just computers connected to the internet. It's the same as running it on your laptop. It's just running it on a machine that's running 24-7 and has a static IP address, so, uh, so you know how to connect to it. Then you link that static IP address to a domain name, and then somebody can connect to your, uh, to your app. You, I mean, there, there's nothing. What I mean when I say that is there's no software left that you have to build 
to have your app available to the whole world. You built that whole piece of software. It's ready to be used by billions of people. Granted, you, you'd wear down your software or your hardware. You wouldn't have enough CPU. Uh, but it can, software-wise, handle it. And finally, uh, just looking forward to, to level four. So those are a few things looking back. And uh, at my main point, we'll show those two slides. Just a reminder or, or kind of pointing out explicitly that when you have a GUI and you're writing the, the model of your game, you can use that GUI to test your model. It might save you a lot of time other than writing unit tests. You can spot the bugs a lot quicker if you know, the physics doesn't work on Jumper, if the clicking a button doesn't work in Clicker, you can figure that out oh, immediately. You have to write in a unit test that something's wrong. For your project, demo three, you're writing a server, you fire up the GUI and nothing happens, you don't have to write a unit test for that to know something's broken. You can see it pretty easily. You can save a lot of time just by getting that first round of testing. Oh, the app doesn't work. I know there's a bug. Uh, it can save you rounds. Anyway, uh, so looking forward, level four, the theme here is kind of the theme of the whole semester to an extent, but reusing code, writing code that can work in many different applications. I want to write one piece of code and have that able to be used everywhere. We saw this with physics engine. We wrote this physics engine that had no idea what jumper was. It has no idea what the project in lab is, but uh, at least in mine, I used the physics engine for the overworld movement. It had, the physics engine has no idea what either of those things are, but it works for those without modification. We don't have to change anything with that. So we want to do that, take that same idea, and just see a few more concepts that are going to help, that, help us with that. One, first order functions. This idea that it's been teased a few times, it's been teased in 115. I flashed it a few times earlier this semester, is functions in Scala in a, in several other languages can be treated as regular values. They're just regular values. We can pass them into functions. We can return them from functions. We can store them in variables. We can do anything we can do with any of our other value, values. In Scala, they're just objects with a different type. So we can do whatever we want with these functions, and we're going to see some things where we can take advantage of that to really, uh, to really do some powerful things. Question? So for, sorry, but for the MMO homework, if we're canceling project for a demo, what is the situation with the... Wait, for the last homework? Yeah. So, so the last homework's not effective. Okay. Uh, The, the last homework will be uh, kind of a, a stripped down project. It'll have the same idea where we have many players being able to communicate with each other in, through that game. Um, but it'll be way stripped down feature set. And a big focus of that is going to be pathfinding. We want to be able to uh, navigate through, through space through pathfinding, which we'll see, which will be the last topic of the course. Um, type parameters. So if you write a function, you have to specify all the types, the parameter types, the return types. With a type parameter, with type parameters, we can say, let's not do that. Let's just leave the type up to, uh, up to the caller and let the caller decide what type this function takes. And we'll see an example of that today. And in fact, the lecture question as well. It takes a type parameter. And then data structures. The data structures we use uh, are all, they all take type parameters, they're all very flexible. A data structure is never written for a specific type. We can create a list of any types. We can do a lot of things with that list without that list having to know anything about our usage beforehand. So we're gonna crack open linked lists and trees and we'll create our own data structures of those types and, uh, and see how they're implemented and how they can be used in a generic way to handle any types and write functions and use type parameters to be able to do a lot of things with those. And references will be coming back in force. Um, references, we talked about it implicitly. You have to understand references um, pretty much all the time when you're programming. But we're going to bring them back and put them back in the spotlight for a while when we talk about linked lists and trees. All right, with that, any questions? Oh, man, it's 
Take a break. Uh, any, was there any questions before we get into today's content? All right. Let's talk about sorting. We've all. Uh, Let's talk about sorting. We've, uh, we all know what sorting is. Let's revisit this and talk about it in a 116 way. So first, the, the lecture question. Writing a function that takes both a type parameter and a function as a parameter. We're going to see how to do both of those things today. Uh, and just write a very simple function. It, doesn't, it won't have too much complexity, but just to get the idea of taking a type parameter and a function as a parameter. So sorting, we've sorted before. We want to order elements based on some function, based on some compare. We've done this in 115. Um, even if you haven't taken it here, I think custom sorting is usually a topic in, in a CS1 course. Uh, if not, we'll have a very quick review regardless. So here's sorting in Scala. Take a, a data structure called dot sort. Too fancy, not too crazy. So that sorted is going to return a new list. It's a complete copy of the input list. It's something I haven't stressed too much this uh, this semester. But lists, the lists we've been using in Scala are immutable, which means you cannot change the values or add values to a list or remove values. You can't do any of that. Whenever you change anything about a list, it returns a copy of that list with the change applied to it. And the original list still exists. So here, numbers.sorted returns a copy of this list with all the same elements, but in sorted order. Not too much to say. That, that shouldn't, uh, shouldn't shock anybody. Not, uh, not blowing anyone's mind with that one. So if I just call that sorted, I'm getting a default sorted order. Here, since I have integers, it's going to be sorted from least to greatest, and that's how the elements are going to be placed. Specifically, this is sorted based on the less than method, which is the common default way to sort numbers. We take the less than method and say, if I have two elements in this list that needs to be sorted, and I say, is this one less than this one, and that returns true, then this element has to come before this element in the list. So I'm applying the less than method to figure out what the sorted order must be. So what if we don't like less than, or, uh, or what, if we, what if we want to sort by the default order but based on a different value other than just the value itself? Well, we can actually call a different method on a Scala list, and most likely just support some aspect of this. They'll just have different syntax, different method names. We can sort by a specific value based on a function that we're going to apply to each element. So if I want to sort these values by absolute value, I can give that, I can call it sort by instead of just sorted, sort by, give it a method in this case, or a function in other cases, apply that function to each element, and then sort by the default ordering based on the return values of that method or function. This is what we call a first order function. We did this with, uh, with JavaScript and Python last semester. Uh, but, but we didn't really talk about what we were really doing. We were just like, yeah, give it a function. It's fine. Now we want to talk about what we're doing here. So we gave sort by a method, in this case, a method of the math object, a method, and applied that method to each value. So instead of just sorting these values, we call math.abs on every single value and sort based on those return values of that function or method that we gave the sort by method. And I'll, I'll try to keep my method and functions straight throughout this, uh, this whole uh, three weeks. It'll be tough. I might slip up once or twice. But function, just a reminder, function takes inputs, has outputs and everything like we, we know. A method is a, like a function, but it's attached to an object. So the ABS method is attached to the math object, so it's, uh, so it's a method. So I'll try to keep that straight. I won't, uh, uh, 
I won't hound you if you get the nomenclature a little wrong, that's fine. Um, but I'll try to keep mine straight in lecture. Uh, so we passed a method as an argument to another method. We can do that and we will do that a lot over the next three weeks. That's one of the big topics that we want to focus on. Even when we're talking about data structures and references and type parameters, we want to focus on this idea of first order function. That's going to be the, uh, one of probably the, the biggest theme over these three weeks is the first order functions. I'll bring those up in every example, every lecture that we do. So that's your, your first taste. Um, so what if we want to not use a default sorted order? So in the last slide, we took the absolute value of every element, got those integers as return values, but we still just sorted from least to greatest based on the absolute values. So what if we didn't want to sort by least to greatest? Maybe we want to do decreasing order, sort from greatest to least, or any other crazy ordering that we can come up with any other ordering that we want to sort by. What if we want to do that? We have another method, sort with, which is going to take the comparator. And this is more familiar with what we've seen in 115 last semester. Python had the equivalent of sort by, uh, but JavaScript only had the sort with equivalent, and Python had this as well. This is what we focused on, as long as they're doing it the same way, as long as they did it the same way last semester, as we did it two semesters ago. So sort with is going to take a comparator function, which is going to compare two values and tell us the relative order of those two values. So we can think of this, if we're thinking of this in the less than, uh, with the default less than comparator, we would take in two values and say, if this value, uh, let me just do greater than since it's on the slide. If this value is greater than this value, then this value comes before the other value in the sorted order. So if A is greater than B, A comes before B in the sorted order. To get this comparator property to be able to sort by this, we need a function that takes in two, that takes in two inputs of the type that we're sorting and returns a Boolean. As long as we provide a function or method that, that does that, and a function in this case, as long as we provide a function or method that takes two values of the type we're sorting and returns a Boolean, we can use that as a comparator and call that with, call the sort with method with that as its argument. So here we have a function, takes two ints, returns a Boolean, which is just A greater than B, Kind of ask that question, does A come before B? Well, it does if A is greater than B. We can see this in a little bit different way here. And I want to pull out the function. So there we just gave a function. We defined what's called an anonymous function, meaning we never gave it a name. We just created a function and used it as an argument and then forgot about it after that. Uh, we never referred to it again later. We just created it, used it, and then threw it away. So let's say like if you stop this comparison, like apply to all the other algorithms. Yeah, so so we're gonna use this comparator function to sort these values. So we can sort these values on any comparator that we can dream up and just give it that function that we want to sort by. Does that answer your question? I, I, I think I kind of get what you're saying, and if, I, if I'm understanding it right, the next slide or two is going to get you there. If it doesn't, let me know. Uh, so we're creating a function. We saw this very briefly a while ago uh, when we were talking about buttons in the GUI. But here we're taking a func we're creating a function, we're creating a variable name comparator of type, and the type is a function of type function that takes two integers and returns a boolean. Syntax can look a little foreign at first when you're not used to it, but we're, we're treating this whole thing as the type. And implicitly we're defining a type of function and we're defining that by its parameter types and its output, its return type. And then we use this syntax, the, uh, the, this big arrow, separating the, uh, the parameter types and the return type. So this whole thing is the type. 
And then we're going to say that equals, and then define our function there. We're going to name the inputs of type int. They better be of type int because that's what we need here. And that's the type of the variable that we're assigning this to. We're going to take two ints, name them a and b, and then that same arrow, and then some block of code that's going to resolve to the output type. So here, I can do this as a one-liner, so I'm just going to have some Boolean expression here. If I want a larger function, and I'm defining it this way, you can add your braces here. You can have an open brace, as many lines as you want, and then a closed brace, just like you were defining a method. You can do that same thing as well. So this idea that we're creating a function, storing it in a variable, passing it to a method, and just treating a function like it's a regular old variable, like it's, a, like it's an int, or a string, or a double, just like it's any other value, that's what we call first order functions. And Scala supports first order functions. That's what we want to talk about. So we can extend this idea a little bit. Okay, that's great for ints, but uh, how often are we just sorting ints? That's not too interesting. So what if we combine this with our polymorphism before? We had this animal example where we had cats and dogs with a make sound method. What if we want to sort those using polymorphism? So say we have a list of animals. This list can contain cats and dogs. Cats and dogs both extend animal. So we have polymorphism. We have a polymorphic list of different types. How are we going to sort this thing? Well, no big deal. The, the concept hasn't changed at all. We just need a function or a method, a method in this case, that's going to take two animals and return a boolean. So depending on how I want to sort these, I can sort my animals by any, um, by any boolean expression I want to sort by. Here I'm going to say the uh, I'm going to sort by their, sort them alphabetically ignoring case. So I'm going to take the lowercase of the two animal names, then use the less than, Scala strings, uh, the Scala string less than method is going to compare these lexicographically, which is alphabetically, but does take case into account. So I'm going to take the lowercase of each of the names and then sort them lexicographically with case ignored since I took the lowercase of both names. So I'm going to define this method in some class. It might be in the animal class. It might be in some other class. It doesn't matter where, where this method lives. And then sort with, sort my list with that method. inside the class, you have to extend comparable, if I, if I recall, you extend comparable and then part of the comparable interface has the compare to method and override that. You can do that and define it inside the animal class in this case, and that's going to give you your default sorting. So if you call dot sorted, it's going to refer to that and sort by that, that method. But if you have a class and in two different cases you want to sort in two different ways, you would have to use something like this. You'd have to define your comparators outside of the class. That'll just give you the default comparator for your class. Like an int has that overridden to compare by the less than method. Um, but if you want two different sorting uh, ways of sorting, you'd have to use something like this. But how does it all work? Okay, so, so that much was reviewed from 115, it's just how to do it in Scala, and, uh, and explain a little more about first order functions. We did use first order functions in both JavaScript and Python, we just didn't highlight it that much, or at least I never do when I teach in 115. Uh, maybe they did last year, but, uh, but we probably, they probably didn't highlight it very much, because that's our job in 116. 
So how does this work and how are we actually using those comparator methods to actually sort the values that we have? So let's look at selection sort, let's revisit this. We talk about this in 115, but it's jammed in one jam-packed lecture with selection sort and merge sort. Uh, so let's go over this a little bit slower and look at how selection sort works. So for this, we're going to iterate over the indices of our list. And for each indice, we're going to choose, we're going to decide which value belongs at that index in the sorted order, in the final sorted order. And then swap, uh, then swap those values. So if we have this list, we're going to start with index number one. We're going to find the minimum value of the entire list and then swap whatever's in at index zero with the minimum value. And I keep repeating. And each time we go down this list, we're going to ignore all the indices that we've already checked, that we've already visited. So when we visit the first index, we're going to look through the entire list, and each time we're going to take whatever's in, whatever's at index one, we're going to compare it to negative 23 and say, is, negative, is five less than negative 23? No, negative 23 definitely goes with 4 or 5, so we're going to mark that. Then we're going to say, is negative 23 less than 8? Is negative 23 less than 7? Negative 23 less than negative 4? Negative 23 less than 10? After all that, we find that negative 23 is the smallest value, and then we can do our swap. We ignore the 23 because we already found, okay, the min value of the entire list has to be the first element in the sorted order. We already found that, so this is done. Then we're going to look at what's remaining, find the minimum value, and then swap. And we're going to do that by checking. Is 5 less than negative 8? No. Negative 8's our min. Is negative 8 less than 7? Is negative 8 less than negative 4? So on and so on. Freeze negative 8. Is 5 less than 7? Yes. Is 5 less than negative 4? No. Negative 4 less than 10? No. Negative 4 gets swapped. And so on. I won't bore you with every single one of these. Um, I assume you get the idea. Um, take the, the rest, compare, uh, compare, compare, swap, compare, swap, compare, swap. Done. Sorted order. So, uh, so we got these in sorted order. And notice throughout all of that algorithm, we've only ever compared two values. So, uh, so when I, sometimes I said just find the min, but to find the min, we're doing a lot of comparing just two values. We're saying, is this value less than this one? Is this value less than this one? Et cetera, et cetera. How do we compare those two values? So throughout all this code, uh, just to run through it quick, we're we're making a, we're copying the, the list over by uh, by reference only. These are I don't know if we have to focus on the, this nuance point yet. This is by reference only, so any change made to data is also made to input data. But a list is immutable. We're not allowed to make changes to it. Any method we call on it is returning a brand new list. So we actually don't have to worry about the pass by reference in this case uh, because lists are immutable. So we're going to iterate over the indices, find the minimum for each indice, and then swap the minimum with the index that we're looking at. This is a completely, gen well, oh, not yet, but this is a mostly generic method. It doesn't know that we're sorting from least to greatest, from greatest to least, for a, by absolute value. It doesn't know. But we are going to give it a comparator in the format that we expect. We're going to take a function as a parameter and then use that function to compare values. So if our comparator is the less than, is the first int less than the second int, then this is going to sort in increasing order. If it's greater than, it's going to sort in decreasing order. If it's whatever function we want to give it, it's going to sort based on that order, just by doing this comparison. And this is what we call comparison sort. 
any sorting methods that you've seen, uh, at least in classes so far, suction sort, merge sort, bubble sort, whatever you've seen, they're all comparison sorts, which means they take a function that takes just two values and returns a boolean. And this is what all our sorting methods are based on in programming, is this idea of give it a comparator, and the algorithm will take it over after that. All of this algorithm is shared no matter how we're sorting. Doesn't matter what we're sorting by, just pass it a comparator and it'll ask the comparator how to sort these values. So no matter what comparator we give this, it's going to sort just like when we were calling sort with. It's going to take that comparator in the same exact style and sort based on that comparator. So this is the other side of, uh, so in 115, we took functions and said, sort with this comparator. Now we can see the other side of that. Okay, what was, how would that work? Well, we take the comparator as a parameter and call that comparator whenever we need to. So if we want to sort these by decreasing value, we're going to call our selection sort method, give it a list, give it a comparator, and it's going to return the sorted order based on our comparator, decreasing order in this case because it used greater than instead of less than. Any questions on this? Yeah. What was that? Uh, so this is finding, you can think of this as finding the minimum of a list. We want to keep saying, like, if we're finding minimum, we would say, what's the minimum found? Oh, I left my variables in that, too. Uh, what's the minimum found? If this is less than the minimum found, then this is the new minimum. And I want to remember the index of where I got it from. So now, instead of always using less than to find the min or greater than to find the max, we're abstracting that away and saying, let's just give it any comparator and find the most significant value based on this function that we're giving it. So like in this case, we're given the function greater than. So this, that's going to find the max value. But say I, I gave um, absolute value of A greater than absolute value of B. Now I'm going to find the maximum absolute value. So then this negative 23 is going to be the, the maximum value instead of this 10. So whatever function I pass here, this function is going to be called here. So where is it oh, where is, oh sorry, I misunderstood. This uh, right here. Right. So this is a, a parameter named comparator. And then when I call int selection sort, the second parameter is that comparator. So you can read this like when we created that comparator in, the, in an earlier slide, we said val comparator of type int int to boolean equals this function. Here we're doing the same thing except we're passing it as an argument into a method. Yes. And, it's, uh, and there's a bit of new syntax and stuff there. So, uh, So this, this is the end of the parameter list right here. I'm saying this takes a one parameter of type list of int and another parameter of type function of int and int to boolean. So that's the type of the function, is some function that takes two ints and returns boolean. I don't have to define anything else here. I'm just saying, give me a second parameter of type function of two ints to a boolean, and then when I This, is, this right here is the crux of it. If you understand this slide, you're going to be good moving forward. If not, we're going to see more examples, so it'll hopefully sink in after we see a bunch of examples.
So uh, apply, apply for a Scala list is similar to give me the element at this index. So it's similar to, uh, to like an array in other languages where you have to square the brackets and you give it an int, say give me the value of this int. Apply is the same idea. And we'll, we actually will explore that quite a bit next week. Since this is a linked list, we can't actually just access the value at a particular index. The, that apply method is actually a really expensive method. It has to hop around in memory i times to find the value that it's looking for. Um, so that's why it's not just uh, not the same syntax. It's a, a method that actually does a lot of work in this case for a linked list. Update is going to set the value at this index to this value. And, it, it, and I'm using the word index literally there. It's, uh, since this is a list, again, we can't just say, um, we can't just say data of min index equals data dot by i, or data of i. With arrays, we could get away with that. With lists in Python, we could get away with that. Um, but since these are linked lists, we have to call some pretty expensive operations here. Uh, this, uh, this sorting method is actually really inefficient with the, the way that it's working with linked lists. Um, but this is going to access, it's going to hop this many times, find the value at that index and replace it with what I give it. And this method, it, for those of you, uh, for those of you thinking about it and, and squirming a little, this selection sort itself is very inefficient, but I purposely wrote this method to be even more inefficient. This is horribly, horribly inefficient. I think I hit, um, I believe I hit n to the fourth on this one, did I? Update, apply, maybe not. Maybe just n to the third. Uh, but it's a horribly inefficient algorithm. Because it's using linked lists, but I'm using linked lists as though they were arrays, where I'm, and that's where I'm losing a lot of efficiency. Um, I do that on purpose because we're talking about linked lists next week, and I want to flash back to this and say how horrible it was. All right, any other questions on this one? Is it? Yeah. Yep. Up, updated. Um, apply, size, apply. These, those are all built into the list. Yep. The value at that index. Yep. So apply of two is going to give me this negative eight in the unsorted list. Okay. So what about custom types? That sorting method. It's only for ints. What about our custom types? If we abandon our animals here. We can't sort these anymore with that selection sort that we just wrote. This is a problem. We wrote a, a function, a, a method. It can sort ints by any comparator you give it, but it can only sort ints. So this isn't really hitting our, we want to reuse code and make code that's flexible and usable in many applications. It's really missing that point. Because how often are we actually sorting ints? Not all that often. We're usually sorting some class, maybe so sorting a class by an integer value of one of its uh, one of its fields or something. But we're usually not just sorting by ints or just sorting by doubles or stuff. We want to sort some animals based on some string comparison um, and, and other things. So how do we, uh, based on the, the lowercase value, the, the uh, case ignored alphabetical ordering um, of the names of animals. That's some our sorting method that we just saw can't do. So we have to do something. We're going to use type parameters. This is one of the other, probably the other big fundamental things that we'll see. That the rest of the three weeks are applications of first order functions and type parameters and bring back references to build our data structures next week, uh, next two weeks. So type parameters. This, these are additional parameters to our methods and classes, though I don't think we'll see them in classes. We, we've used them in classes, I don't think we'll write a class. Um, but we will write methods that take type parameters. It's a, these are additional parameters that are only types 
meaning that the type can be different every time the method is called. And then we can use that type throughout the entire method, wherever we want. We use um, brackets instead of parentheses for these, and they come before the standard parameter list. So if we want a method that takes a type as a parameter, we'll define that here, and then we can use that type whenever we want. Now instead of a selection sort that only sorts ints, we're saying this selection sort can sort any type ever, even types it's never heard of before. Notice that uh, a list, dictionaries, or not dictionaries, maps in Scala, uh, the sorting methods, everything that we've written can be used on classes that we've created. You can write a brand new class that the creators of Scala have never heard of ever, and you can create a list of them because list takes a type parameter when you create them. You say, give me a list of animals, and the list works with that type parameter that you gave it when you created it. Same thing here, we're using the same idea. We're gonna give this a type parameter, and then we say, okay, give me the type parameter, but also tell me how to work with this type. So if we take a type parameter here, we're gonna say, give me a list of that type, give me a comparator of that type, and I'll return you a list of that type. I don't care what that type is, but whatever type it is, you better be consistent. Give me a list of that type and a comparator for that type, and I'll return you the sorted list of that type. And we usually shorten this a bit. If you ever see type parameters, when you're writing them, just to stay consistent with the standards, it's usually only one character. It's one of the rare times where, um, where computer science likes to, uh, computer scientists and programmers like to use single variable, uh, single letter variables is in type parameters. We just use one letter. Here I chose T, but it's a variable. You can name it whatever you want. I named it type in the previous slide and T here. You'll see it in documentation is A. If a function takes two type parameters, you might see A and B, etc. And you can have a, a common separated list. You can have multiple type parameters here uh, if you need that, which we'll, we probably won't see till next week. So this selection sort takes a type and uses that type wherever needed. Now I can use this code no matter what type we're sorting and no matter what the comparator function is. This one algorithm, this one implementation of selection sort can handle it all. Doesn't matter what you throw at it, it's going to be able to handle it. It's going to be able to sort. So we have one very generic reusable sorting method that can be reused for applications that we can't even dream of down the road. As long as somebody provides a list of, that they're sorting and a comparator to sort that type, this method is going to handle that, no problem. In an example, we can use this selection sort just like we use sort with with our animals. We're going to call our selection sort with our list of animals and with our animal, well I did put in the animal class, and our animal comparator, and then it'll sort based on those. Now note that I didn't specify the type parameter when I call the method. We can do that, we can add our type parameters in the method, but Scala helped us out here. It will infer the type based on the arguments that we gave it. So we gave it a list of animals and a comparator, a function that takes two animals and returns a boolean. Scala said, I see where you're going with this. I think the type parameter is animal. It can, it can figure that out, so it's going to uh, infer that without us having to explicitly say, hey, Scala, the type parameter is animal here. It's just going to look at what we gave it. Oh, that's a list of animal. This takes two animals. Type parameter is animal. Uh, it's just like when you create a list. You create a list and then give it some values. It's going to figure out what the type parameter is by the types that you gave it or by the variable that you're assigning to. It'll figure out what the types are. You never say list of this type parameter and then your, your list. Um, it'll infer that. Okay, everything's fine with that, but it's really, really slow. You've seen this in 115. You'll see this a few more times. This is something we love to use. Uh, the, the spoilers and merge sort is coming up on Friday. The comparison between any n squared sorting algorithm and merge sort, uh, it's a great teaching tool. We use it to teach a lot of different things. In this class, we use it to teach 
passing functions as parameters, and also our first little bit of in-depth look into recursion. We're going to crack open that merge sort and see how that recursive algorithm works to be able to get us the sorting order that we want and do it a lot faster than selection sort did. Bring us back to that. So we're right on time, too. And with that, I'll see everyone Wednesday. Don't forget about the quiz. And